this our brain treatment is giving to you. You are a robot, and that's all you are. No one knows your name. No one knows your name. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of X Cleveland Live. Whatever the hell that means. X Studios? I don't even know where I am anymore. Uh, it's Saturday, May the 290th um, of 2019. Uh, I'm Andrew. Welcome back. Uh, my guest today is the elusive and illustrious Adam Boos from Cauliflower Audio. How are you, Adam? I'm doing great. Good, man. I'm doing really good. There we go. That's better. Now we're... I I got my coffee in. and uh, I mean, it's a different time zone uh, over here uh, in Bay Village. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're out like what? About seven miles, I think. Yeah. So what is that? Seven hours? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We do have uh, um, Paul from Maryland says greetings from Partly Cloudy, Maryland. Uh, Oh. Information Trey says... (laughs) <laughs> hi john <laughs> so um adam boos andrew Lent, the extraordinaire owner and mastering engineer for cauliflower audio that's me that is you um let's talk a little bit about we're gonna get started with where you come from what's your story where i come from yeah what's your story um My story, uh, I was born in, um, uh, well, I was born in Oberlin, Ohio, which Mm -hmm. is one of my favorite places in the world. Yes. Uh, um, We've spent lots of time there together. Yes, Um, we have. Yes. Um, My mom's 50th birthday party we talk a lot about, which is. That was a lot of fun. I that see. was a lot of fun. Like, I remember being really drunk, and I remember we kept on talking about wasps' nests and how many yes. syllables are in wasps' nests. Yeah, a lot more than you would you would actually think. I know, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm, I was uh, I grew up in Oberlin. Well, I grew up outside of Oberlin, um, in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't even really have a name. It's <laughs> more of a township called Florence Township, and. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so I grew up out there. Um, I went to school, and it was miserable, you know, cornfields and uh, horrible people. Um, But I do love the country. Um, And, uh, yeah, so, you know, I I grew up out there. um, And uh, Oberlin was always a nice place to escape to, um, you know, because I had, like, you know, international students Mm -hmm. and... And there was like kind of like a big queer presence. Mm-hmm. And so it was a nice place to escape from, like going to school out there. Right. And that's kind of where a lot of my world sort of opened up out there. And you were you were a townie. You weren't just a, you weren't a student at Oberlin, right? I was not a student. No, okay. I, uh, I I merely um, I merely gleaned from the uh, from the uh, the student body. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Disgusting. I like the <laughs> idea of you gleaning from student bodies, but I mean, well, maybe know. I don't really. I don't know. Yeah, the student bodies have a bad reputation. Yeah, what they that movie was reputation. terrible though. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so young Adam Boos in the wild streets of Oberlin, Ohio. Yeah, lost yeah. in cornfields. Lost in cornfields, driving through cornfields. Right. Um, yeah, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, I did grow up kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, and I was very fortunate that um, the kids across the street uh, were older than me. There was like three or four of them, and they were all like, I mean, this was like the late 70s, early 80s, so they're getting right. into like, Kiss and like, I don't know what else, but um, I got really into Kiss through them, like listening to records when I was like four or five years old. and. Um, I really just got into them. That was kind of where my whole like, um, 
uh, I don't know, interest in like rock mm -hmm. music came from music in general. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I always kind of knew I wanted to play music, do something with that. You know, growing up, I always had like little tape recorders, record players. Um, my first records were Hollow Notes and Kiss. So you can kind of see the direction that that's taking me. Surprised um, me the least. Yeah. Um, I used to carry around this Fisher Price record player uh, that and played um, You Lost That Love and Feeling by ho their Hollow Notes version. Yeah, right, right. And I drove my parents crazy with it. I don't know <laughs> why that song. It's like my least favorite song of theirs, but apparently back then I was like really into it. Yeah, well, you know. Our music, yeah. our music tastes change from when we're five to yeah, you know. kind of. I mean, I'm still sort of into Kiss and Hollow Notes, but right? But you're not into that song. That's true. Yeah. This is true. This yeah. is true. So, uh, real quick question. And yeah, I know that I know that Johnny uh, is also a fan of Kiss. So, which Kiss member would you dress up as? <sighs> which Kiss? Uh, Paul. Paul, Paul Stan. All right. I mean, yeah. All yeah. Right. Information tray. What? What Kiss character? Kiss character. What member of Kiss? I think that they're like. I think that they're like fictional. Personally, I don't think they really exist. Uh, yeah, and they don't. Information tray is Ace. Uh, okay. Anybody yeah. else? On the other listeners out there, Kiss. What Kiss character would you dress up as? I don't know any of them. I would probably dress up as the Star Guy. What's that guy's name? That's Paul. That's yeah. Paul. Okay, so you're Paul already. So I guess I got to be Gene Simmons, don't I? Yeah. Yeah. I got, Paul I got is the, like. The the conscience. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, you're definitely a gene. Yeah, I'm a gene. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, gene. So, which <clears throat> member of Hollow Notes are you? I mean, is it obvious? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely, 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 John. Yeah, Hollow I Notes. mean, you know, I'm the guy. You know, uh, I, I always wanted to. Well. I fashioned myself as sort of a front man in my like early twenties, mm -hmm. but um, I, I I think I found my strength is in the oats, um, the oats role of being the guy that kind of like takes it over the finish line with mm -hmm. the with the the blue eyed blonde star. Right. Yeah, you're sort of the mustache of the group. Exactly. Yeah. Think of like the famous mustachers, um, John Oates. Um, Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. I he was, you know, um, what's his name? Giorgio Moroder. Yes. Yeah. So all yes. of Frankie goes to Hollywood. All of Frankie goes to Hollywood, really. <laughs> Soft Cell. Soft Not Cell. Not Mark Allman, but the other guy. The lead yeah. singer from Ultravox, didn't he have? Yes. Gosh, I yes. Think he did. Yeah. Yes. Very. Yeah. And I think it, at times it was kind of, it, it varied in height. Yeah. So sometimes he had the really thin little, like, you know, yeah. suave. But this means nothing to me. Oh yeah. No. So okay, back back to younger back to younger boots. Yes. Um so yeah, so I, I grew up out there. Um I also on the same street with the uh the kids that were into KISS, um a little bit later in life I made friends with another guy who was uh three years older than me mm -hmm. and he was into like Joy Division and New Order and Skinny Puppy and Ministry and like that sort of color of like alternative music. Mm -hmm. I list I'd heard of like and I had tapes of like the Dead Milkmen and uh, the Violent Femmes and kind of like Falco, you know, kind of early stuff. You know, Columbia Records. I like um, that those three are matched together. They kind Especially of are. Falco. <laughs> yeah well i mean you know columbia and uh record yeah. and Peace club you know yeah um but yeah my first kind of getting into like alternative i was like probably like 14 or 15 and uh yeah he introduced me to a bunch of stuff and that kind of was where i really kind of I, I guess i kind of started from um i always had like you know plastic toy guitars and stuff growing up but uh, when I was around 15, I think I got a four track for Christmas mm -hmm. and I started collecting like effects pedals and uh, drum machines. I remember we had one of those spirit days at high school. Some one man band came in. I can't remember what the guy's name was. I think his name was Chris Luke. And I think that he still somewhere is known in the Cleveland uh, lineage of like 
synth pop. I don't. Or, oh wow! I, I, I thought he'd been like known for like in Cleveland High School, like the Cleveland High. No, School this guy was like I think I I don't know who he was tied in with, but um, I'm oh. sure people know remember his name. Um, but he had like he brought in all these MIDI synths and drum machines, and I'd never seen anything like that. Right. Sorry, my just keep fogging up. That's um, funny. and uh, so that just was where my mind like I was like, oh, I don't need other bandmates to make music i can just get these machines <laughs> i was always kind of shy and never really wanted to be around people sure. and so that worked out really great um so you know when i was 15 i you know discovering what drum machines and all that stuff were i that's where i started kind of collecting stuff buying a casio off uh the plain dealer classified ads because it has a midi connection oh, yeah. and that's sort of where my world blew up you know where you start <laughs> sequencing and um yeah and uh <clears throat> and then right around that same time i met another guy in high school um he transferred and he had long hair and he was into like satan and alistair crowley and uh, ozzy and you know that edge so right we became really close friends um, and uh, started making music out there. It was very like controversial, even to this day, fairly controversial, but especially in the cornfields, you know, right. Uh, very uh, confrontational, anti-religion mm -hmm. sort of, you know, stuff that you do when you're an annoying 15 year old. High school rebellion. A school rebellion. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, and I think it was really just a way for us to stay safe. Mm hmm as we were definitely the weirdos sure we were like the only two weird guys in our school so mm -hmm. or at least in our grade so um you know skinny puppy logos on my books saved me because people thought they were satanic symbols <laughs> so that was great you know i saved a lot of ass kickings mm -hmm. from like being a punk or whatever right um yeah and then uh yeah so we did that was my first band with with will and uh and then from there, it just kind of, I don't know, I, I really, I got a four track and I really started getting into recording and creating. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, coming out of high school, I knew that that's what I wanted to get into. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh where they had like an audio program. Right. Um, and they had tape machines, but they also had like, this was like 94, 95. So they had the beginning of Pro Tools, which was called Session 8 at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And Sound Designer 2, which was like an echo or um, an editing program. Mm -hmm. So that was like my first venturing into what mastering was. I, I, you know, I didn't know what it was back then. I, uh, I, I'm not sure that I know what it is now, but um, <laughs> that was kind of my first uh, introduction into it. And right. uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, you, so, that, so you went to you went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh? Yes, and, I did. And um, you were out there for a couple of years? Yeah, I came, was out for a couple of years. That's sort of where I started my first like, well, solo. It started as a solo thing, mm -hmm. furnished me. Um, where I fancied myself as a singer and uh, and um, yeah so like when I moved I kind of developed that in Pitts in Pittsburgh you know a lot of class projects were me recording in the studios and mm -hmm. doing that sort of stuff and then when I got back um, my friend Lisa which we know Lisa mm -hmm. very well um, her and I kind of uh, started Furnace Street in earnest mm -hmm. uh, and um furnished in furnished street yeah yeah, yeah. furnished comes home yes um so uh yeah and that so right around then i think was like 97 98 mm -hmm. oh right around the same time i um i started work at when i came back from school i had a couple like coffee shop and record store jobs but then i started working at a to z audio right which was in like 97 i think i started there mm -hmm. And um, that was where, you know, they could duplicate cassettes and CDs and all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of where I got into that. Mm -hmm. And concurrently, I mean, Lisa and I were making music, trying to um, do the touring and, uh, excuse me, that sort of thing. So that's when we moved to Lakewood mm -hmm. and uh, 97, 98. And that's when I met you. 
That's correct. That is, you know, I Lakewood was name. the, it, yeah. Well, did we meet at the fantasy? We met at the fantasy. We were both playing a show. And I remember I met, I remember I met Brian first. And, <laughs> um, which, you know, there you go. Now, um, and I remember that Brian, I remember you guys had like all your backing tracks on a cassette. Yes. And I was like, why are you, that's so weird. You know, and I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I still don't. But I mean, back then I was like, oh, that's so cool. Uh, my volume is very low, apparently. I'm sorry. I'm, apparently I'm talking low. That should be better. <clears throat> Hi. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's when we met. And I think that we all, I think that we all hated each other at that point, too. Yes. At the beginning, yeah. we did not get along. Yeah. We were these like uh, carpet baggers from the middle of nowhere <laughs> and came in. And, uh, there was some drama <clears throat> that happened early on. Oh, yeah. That, um, I remember we ran into each other at, at uh, My Friends, mm -hmm. and it was, like, very tense. Yeah, I said a really shitty thing to you. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> we there was some, there. I think there was a misunderstanding, and we I think we're all kind of threatened of each other back then. Oh, yeah. And, you know, because that's kind of a very Cleveland thing, mm -hmm. especially when you're in, like, your 20s. Um, you know, there's only so much su success that, you know, is exists in the city. So we better all be super protective of right the 10 people that come to see us or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, but, you know, as, as years went by, obviously, um, we still hate each other. I can't stand this I guy. I fucking hate you people. You know, it's, it's really <laughs> it's I, I can barely do this. Uh, I, I, that's why you're over there and my camera's here. So I don't really have to look at you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's when you and I met, we started playing mm -hmm. shows together. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we had a cassette. Uh, I couldn't afford a dat machine at the time mm -hmm. because that was what you were supposed to play your tracks on right yeah that's that what all the that's what all the the, the cool kids and yeah. others did so we would rent debt machines mm -hmm. and you know from lentines, and, lentines. Mm -hmm. uh and uh when i think of music i think of lentines oh yeah um uh and yeah so we would we would put our, our um our tracks on dad but yeah i think one broke down at one show or something it was Dads were always, and they still to this day, are the most finicky tape because the tape is, like, so thin. Oh, yeah. It's garbage. It's, it's like, it's amazing that it worked back then. Mm -hmm. It's amazing when you pull out a dad tape now and it still works. Right. So I always tell people when they're <clears throat> when they're sending dads in for some sort of restoration or reissue, I'm like, I really hope that um, this doesn't get destroyed, you know, because it's, it's very... <laughs> likely <laughs> uh, i don't know if that's true but um they're very they're very delicate yeah oh yeah sure. very delicate oh yeah um and uh yeah right around that time i think i also bought um yeah so i was like working with like an sr16 um a boss dr 550 and then some casio uh with a midi I, I, it might have even had those yellow drum pads on top. Oh yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. Um, I or there, that, I might be mixing up a couple, but that was like kind of what I worked with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then at Lentines again, shout out to Lentines, Lentines Parma. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Um, I bought on credit a an MC three hundred three, mm. which was that silver groove box yep. with all like classic uh raw and drum machine sounds and stuff mm -hmm. and uh that was really where i keep saying that was where everything took off because right. there are a lot of different jump off points but that really you know um that you know that was where i actually had like an arpeggiator for the first time mm -hmm. and um like sine waves and like really starting to be able to like i mean and granted that thing's basically like a toy but right. like learning about synthesis sure right and learning uh, what the building blocks of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after, <clears throat> I got a uh, Roland W30. The infamous um, W30. Which I still have. In nice. The back, 
which is that's my little we'll, we'll look at that later Ooh. um but that was like my first sampling workstation uh mm-hmm. mike tech speak mm-hmm. uh he had one and, yeah i remember that um uh he you know he he kind of talked me into it mm-hmm. and uh <clears throat> it was a great you know that would that again was like just kind of like blew my mind open like being able to actually sample and sequence and uh get really granular with the sequencing Mm -hmm. and I think maybe a pattern of, of of unnecessary obsession with, with music and, Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, uh, sequencing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's, there's a, I didn't even know that what this was called until recently when you told me like tracker Mm -hmm. sequencers. Yeah. I think, that's what I was editing in, and I didn't even really know. And I still, mm-hmm. I, I would rather not ever do sequencing that way again. <laughs> On the like the W thirty sequencer. No, that thing is so I wanna, yeah. I remember that. Jump I don't want to have to think about like the length of every note mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. You know, like that. That it's 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 unnecessary. Yeah. For what I do. Anyway. Sure. Oh, um, no, absolutely. But back then it wasn't, and right. I really got into sequencing like hardcore and really like i said granular and um yeah right around then was when i I think it was like almost like 2000 and yeah just kind of obsessing it was like uh okay computer came out Mm -hmm. and it really kind of changed what like a lot of people making music in a lot of different like genres um it kind of brought back uh at least in my opinion it brought back like a focus on analog synths mm-hmm. i mean aphex twin and a lot of people and skinny puppy you mm-hmm. know they never stopped using analogs right. but um radio had kind of brought out the like you know modulars mm-hmm. and like people things that people hadn't seen in forever Mellotrons and exactly yeah. and that was like because shortly before that i I was, uh, I got really into industrial music. I think I skipped over that, but I was really into industrial after I met uh, my friend John back in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got really into that stuff. But then when like the nineties rolled around mid nineties, I got super into like no effects pedals, like DC, like post hardcore, like indie rock, the beginnings of Evo and stuff where Mm -hmm. it was like, you were kind of looked down on if you used anything other than like a tuner mm-hmm. or a delay, like with a lot of those bands mm-hmm. it just, it was very like, because of like Fugazi and a lot of those bands, it was like, we're, you know, Steve Albini, like everything is stripped down. Everything is honest. Mm-hmm. This is like hardworking people's indie rock, you right. know? So I think we, we kind of got into that for a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were trying to marry like those two things, but then Radiohead came along and they're like using phasers yeah. and like they just all give sorts a shit. of right. and, then, and then all the indie rockers are like, Oh, well, I guess it's okay to use that, you know, <laughs> but still no chorus. You can't right. No chorus is, is a no, no. Yeah. I love chorus personally. Right. Little, you mix it like 5% into anything and it's mm-hmm. it immediately pretty. Glorious, a yeah. Bit bigger, a little, yeah. Um, so yeah, then Radiohead really kind of blew everybody's minds open, mm-hmm. and uh, I would say that was where, like, I started getting really obsessed. I think it also brought in a period of music that was a little too cerebral, you know, like a lot <laughs> of the IDM stuff, which I like. Right. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but um, I think I guess just technology in general. You know, a lot of those guys started seeing how far they could push their their sequencers, mm-hmm. and and like really just drive like the craziest music where you'd listen to it and you'd be like, oh my god, how do people do this? This is incredible. Mm-hmm. And then technology got so affordable, I think that everybody could afford to do that kind of stuff. Right. And then there are plugins that are making things so you can sound like those guys. Mm-hmm. And I think. Um, there's been a shift. I mean, this isn't a surprise, but there's there's like been a shift away from any sort of human performance uh, in recordings that, um, granted, 
like I'm a 44 year old person, like I'm an old man, <laughs> like, you know, angry at the kids, but I, there's, I think there's a, you know, there's a difference between, um, fixing a couple of things or like really just kind of taking the soul out of everything. Right. And, um, there's that danger because it's, it's possible now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I don't know where I was going with that. Oh, Radiohead. Radiohead. Yeah. yeah it's all Radiohead's fault. It is all Radiohead. Both, both positive and negative. I mean, they, I think that they definitely, um, opened up a lot as far as bringing in like synthesis and stuff like that into, into rock music. Yeah. Um, however you want to define that. But I also think that after a while they became a little bit self-indulgent with the whole thing. And I think that I that's, and I, and I, you know, I'm you know, going to be a complete shithead apparently when it comes to Radiohead. I, I like them, but I think like after that song, they just, after that album, they just try to be too clever. Definitely. You know, Definitely. Kid yeah. A was interesting, but then the one right after that, I can't remember what Amnesiac. it was called. Yeah. Amnesiac. Amnesiac. Yeah. It was just kind of like, what, what's going well, on? Well, it just, know? it, it felt really unfocused. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I like when a record has a focus. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can stretch out a little bit, but um, I, I don't know if I, I, I just, I like a record that feels cohesive. Right. And I, you're right. I feel like had they taken those Kid A and Amnesiac and made like one record out of it, I think it would have been like another really great record. Right. Um, I think they have had moments. Uh, I think In Rainbows is their second best after mm -hmm. OK Computer, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, people, as they get older, they change and, and their interests and how sure. they want to make it change. Sure. And, um, I think for them, it's, it's more fun. And I, honestly, there's a part of me that's like this too, where it's more fun because once you get to a certain point, you know, you do have a certain confidence as a musician, mm -hmm. so you can create freely without self editing all the right. time. And say, oh, what is somebody going to think of that mm -hmm. or that sucks or whatever, you get to a certain point where you can kind of just freely create. And then what I like to do, you know, so I'll get some um, drum machines or synths going and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll record a few things. And then you take those things and you kind of put it into a song. Right. With somewhat of a structure, you know, I mean, I, I never used to want to do the verse chorus verse thing. Mm -hmm. um, and now that's really for the most part, what I do sure. because, I don't think, you know, I, for me, it just, it makes, it makes it more fun. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good formula that you can kind of play around with. Mm -hmm. You can still do really interesting things. Like that's what I liked about a lot of the DC and nineties, like rock in general is that they were playing with that formula, but they would change the time signatures or they would do like interesting chords. And, right. uh, so that's like, you know, if you're going to do something, do something a little interesting mm -hmm. um uh but yeah i think that that's a i mean that's kind of a thing is, is you, there is so much you can do in you know what basically you're describing as the as the pop formula yes you know verse chorus verse chorus middle bit you know that kind of thing but there's still a lot you can build into that and you can still and i think that you know as western modern ears a lot of us are used to that structure and that structure right. works for a lot of us which is why pop music is what is called pop music right right um and i think that that's kind of a big thing is, is that there's still a lot you can explore within the confines of that right. world right. i mean that's i mean i've been doing synth pop music for fucking whatever 20 plus years now you know and it's just i still have a lot of fun doing it and i still that's still the process i go back to when i'm actually like making albums right um, right just because I'm always worried that like, you know, if I put out a, you know, two hour long modular album, it's going to be self-indulgent bullshit. Right. Not mentioning any people like that dude from Smashing Pumpkins or that uh, Martin right. Gore or anything like that. But <clears throat> right. I mean, it's art is art. And uh, but yeah, I think I think um, however people create and make and make good art is, is their thing. But mm -hmm. yeah. I think the idea of just like kind of switching stuff on and then jamming and then you snip the beginning and the end. It's like, there it is. It's mm -hmm. done. I mean, sometimes it works, but I think you have to be really good. Sure. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot over the past few years about 
um, improvising, even mm-hmm. with yourself. And it's, I think it, you know, it's just, um, it is remaining like nimble in the, in the space of creation to where like, you're always trying to get a spark off the previous idea. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if you make a mistake, do it twice. Right. Yeah. And then, and, or like, you know, like play off of it. And, um, that's what I, where I think, um, I've really learned as a musician, I think also age and experience comes mm-hmm. into it too. Yeah. But when, when you can, um, when you can just freely work from ideas without self editing, mm-hmm. I think is where the truly great art comes from. No, I, you can, know? I completely. And as difficult as producers and as, you know, audio nerds and, and, and music nerds to not self edit, you know, I think that that's, you know, one of the things that I've been, you know, doing like the music streams when I'm not talking to people and just like, you know, and doing live jams with all the gear and stuff like that is, is the fact that it's like, there's, you know, it's literally a moment in time. It's kind of like what we did with spooky action at a distance where right. we literally just set shit up and made music for a half an hour and didn't give a shit what we're, we had no idea what we were going to do, or where we were going to go. And right, you know, right. for some reason people showed up to watch that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, there's something to be said about that because mm-hmm. you're feeding off the energy that's in the room and right. they're feeding off of you. And it's, it is, again, it's, it's like, it's like taking, um, inspiration from whatever spark and mm-hmm. just building off of it. Yeah, like, exactly. Regardless of what it is, right. you know, right. Um, just being in the moment and being, uh, you know, flexible and honest mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. It's like yeah. a Paul just said, it's a shared experience kind of thing. And Absolutely. And I think exactly. that that's a that's an important thing. And I think that I mean, there's a whole lot of folks that are on like Twitch, which we're doing most of our broadcasting on that will do, you know, we do live jams and most of them are improvised and stuff like that. And we'll go, you know, two hours, um, yeah. which is a perfect time to plug. Uh, hey. Next weekend is uh, Synth Weekend from the Golden Shrimp Guild. It's like pretty much 72 hours of crazy electronic jams starting Friday night. <laughs> Um, I'll be on doing one from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, Eastern time on on Twitch. So uh, if you do not have that information, go join our Discord, which is popping up automatically once in a while on the stream, and check out the Synth Fest page, and that will give you all the updated information and also give you a chance to sign up for it as well, which you can join in and jam and rock out and shit too. <clears throat> yeah, that's the idea. So anyway, back to our interview. I needed. Uh, we need to somehow figure out how we can uh, we can get together and do things and still be distant. Well, I mean, emotionally or socially. Well, I kind of prefer both. Um, yeah. You know, we probably yeah. could. I have a. You, I have a decent sized backyard. That would be fun. And we have long wires. Yes, and I have I have a drum machine that I'll bring. I have a. I have one. I have a. Two. I have me and my beatbox. Just your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, man. so, so, uh, so Furnace Street. Let's talk Furnace a little Street. bit about Furnace Street. God, my fucking glasses is terrible. Um, I'm so making you all hot Street, and bothered. Sorry. Yeah, I know. No, I, I think it is just steamy. It is very steamy. steamy. Um, Furnace Street was like, um, yeah, I, it was right out of high school. Um, I was like a shy, but you know, creative kid. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, it was, you know, I th- the nineties in addition to like, you know, weird, you know, meters and, and chords and that sort of thing. Um, uh, was very personal and very angst driven mm-hmm. and uh, definitely definitely got into that vibe you know um kind of like an emo sort of uh electronic variation um i i don't really know i we were doing i don't i don't know what we were doing when we started uh lisa and i in like 97 or 98 when we really started doing it um the music was kind of um influenced by like a lot of the '90s R&B that was going on, like mm-hmm. I really fell in love with Timbaland's production mm-hmm. um, and his his beat sensibility. Um, 
And that combined with like, you know, um, something that I've always loved is like the funk of Skinny Puppy, mm-hmm. like their bass lines and mm-hmm. the, the grooves. Like there's something about Kevin Key's uh, programming style, at least back then, that was like very funky. Oh, yeah. I always really liked that a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, at that time, I think we were kind of staying away from like putting a lot of effects on guitars, um, except for like delay. We would just we would do a lot of effects on our bass guitar. Right. Um, so I don't know. And it had this kind of uh, this sort the early on, it had sort of like um, a dancey, dark, um, you know, R&B sort of uh indie rock synth pop vibe uh gothy kind of thing Mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a weird combination but that's kind of where it started from like the neuromantic stuff Mm -hmm. a lot of it had those kind of like beats and i just really discovered analog synths and um um, we were more into the sort of like whispery vocals and kind of from outer space type vibes um and I, we got signed to um, my friend Matt's label, Steadfast, which mm-hmm. he's actually still putting my records out. God bless Matt. Um, <laughs> uh, but he he uh, we we started working together at A to Z Audio mm-hmm. um, in like '98 or '9, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, he really liked my demos that I would bring in, and um, he was putting out stuff back then. And uh, so he decided to um, put out our second record. Um, mm-hmm. It's called Lady, Lady Killer, mm-hmm. um, and um, that's probably my favorite one mm-hmm. um, out of everything we did. I feel like it it has the most focus. It has a similar sound kind of running through it. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the lyrics, um, and I'm very sensitive about my lyrics and vocals. Um, that's pretty much the only one I can still listen to. Really? The rest, it's very difficult for me to listen to anything else we've huh. done. Interesting. Um, I think just in terms of like personal stuff, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know that I was being totally honest with myself. Mm. And so like, I look back and see a lot of that stuff and it's just kind of embarrassing and weird for me. I understand. Um, but uh, that lady killer record and then the music, I li- really like the music yeah. that we did on the other records. Yeah. But if you just take, if you can mute the vocals somehow. <laughs> Um, well, I think that, that I, I mean, I think Lady Killer is the one that like is the most like as far as like distorted whispering voices and stuff like that as you were. I mean, and yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be completely contrary to you because I can because fuck you um, <laughs> and say that like your voice got better. And well, you're I singing, you, you know, your singing got really, really good, especially toward um, toward the end there in extra version. Well, thank you, man. Yeah. I mean, I thought your I thought your voice was fucking killer at that point oh. yeah thanks man i really appreciate it. Yeah. that's that's really awesome to hear yeah dude um maybe i'll make it longer than 30 seconds next time i try to listen to <laughs> the, the extra i i think i mean head music is yeah okay second album or third album i should say head music that was that was a good album but that's a tough album yes um i i like i think what i like about head music is that i can definitely identify with like the emotional rawness of that album. Yeah. Because yeah. that was definitely you at your most. Like, Adam Boosie. Adam Boosie, you know, Ad, Adam, Adam Boosie, um, angry, you know, full of, you know, full of angst kind of thing in a way. Angsty Boosie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Angstum Boosie, maybe. Um, you know, that kind of thing. But also like the, that whole like, you know, it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like, like an open scab kind of feel to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my epic as fuck. (laughs) Yeah, my folks were splitting up at the time, Mm -hmm. and I think like just that. um, I think, and just at the time, I think I was in my late Mm twenties and mid twenties. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, But you know, you go through that period of time where you're like, the you know, the world kind of crumbles. Your world crumbles around you as Mm -hmm. like as a young adult, Mm -hmm. and. uh, yeah, so that and then like trying to deal with sexuality mm-hmm. um, and trying to figure out what that stuff is. Um, that's why that record it is. It's very, it's very um, 
it is it's like an open scab yeah. and i when i hear it now i just hear like drama mm-hmm. and like me like you know really just kind of going for it mm-hmm. and um i i think i as a person as a human being i pulled back a little bit sure i'm a little more guarded about my my personal um experiences mm-hmm. uh, and i think that's part of the reason why listening to it it's just like so honest yeah um and uh but uh, yeah thank you um mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, definitely. I remember we were at the fantasy once it was shortly after we played and because what I couldn't do the whispery vocals when we played live, right. So somebody had said to me, you should sing more. And, uh, <laughs> so that's what, that is actually where that came from. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so yeah. And then, yeah. So we did, uh, lady killer and then head music, mm-hmm. like, like you said, very, it's, it's also like an hour long. It's a very, it's long a, yeah, it's an epic album. I mean, the, the, the music in it is really, really good. And like I said, your vocal performance is, you know, is, is really fucking good too. Like I said, it's, it's just that, I mean, and I think part of it is because like, you know, we were friends at that point. So yeah. we actually started getting along and I remember like hearing, you know, were you working on that album, you know, night after night, day after day and everything like that. And also like, I remember, you know, the, the craziness that was going on in our lives at that point and stuff like that as yes. well. So to me, it's, it's weird. It's like a soundtrack in a way for, you know, of my mid twenties. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you, know? you, I mean, you were like, you were, um, um, whether you wanted to or not, you were Furnace Street's road manager <laughs> yeah. in most, in most situations. Yeah. Um, because Lisa and I never had a vehicle that lasted longer than a month. Um, <laughs> we didn't really know how to fix them. And we were always so broke. Right. I and tired. Remember. You were always oh, so tired. Broke, broke and tired because we were living on ramen and cheese sandwiches mm-hmm. and like, you know, two dollars of gas in the gas tank. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember this. Yeah, but you used to, you would drive us like anytime we would have an out of town show, yeah. you would drive. Um, yeah, like get in the car for. I mean, it, it, a it, that, that way I could go and see you guys because I always enjoyed seeing you. Um, it wasn't just because I was you know having sex with Lisa at the time. Um, well, I mean, that had something to do with it, but a lot of I it mean, was you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, whatever. But a lot of it was because I just liked you guys. I liked your I liked hanging out with y'all, and I liked your music as well. Paul, thanks yeah. for hanging out with us today. Um, yeah. Hey, poop. Um, hey, poop. And so we, uh, so that was, that was a lot of it, but also it was just like, you know, I, I just, I really wanted you guys to be successful as much as possible and whatever I could do to help with that. Even That's, if it was just driving yeah. your asses around, you know, I was fine with that. We really appreciated that. Yeah, like Lisa fun. and I talk about that a lot. Um, <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. It was, mm-hmm. cra- I, I wish I could go back then. Yeah. And let your farts on fire again. I, 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 well, I did have fun, but I was always so like angst ridden and, mm-hmm. and, and worried mm-hmm. and anxious, mm-hmm. especially like when we got to go to France Pimu. and you were our road manager there. And <laughs> I just, was. I was like, I'm very thankful that um, we were able to indulge in some white widow and it like. Oh, that's right. You guys did. And you were like, and you saw like God or something like that. And I was like, all yeah, right, we, we got to be up at nine. <laughs> yeah that was an, that was an amazing experience yeah that was so much fun yeah um, that was fun and that was that was the extroversion period of furnace street's yeah, existence yeah. and to me the extroversion album was a breath of fresh air after the intense entanglement that was head music um, yeah it was a lot it was a lot lighter which is weird because there's a lot of dark shit going on at that point as well um yeah and but they like the music wise is a lot it was a lot happier um mm-hmm. and a little bit more freeing and i think that part of that was is a, a you got to you know you, you didn't have to record the whole thing yourself yes and you were able to you're, you guys actually pumped that fucker out pretty quick too compared to head music yeah um i th- so uh head music yeah that was a lot of me um which is which is weird because at that point, Furnace Street was Lisa and Brian and I, mm-hmm. um, and but and and we they the three of us wrote on that record. Right. But I remember most of the time I was staring at the W thirty you know screen, most of the time just at sequencing and just like you know working on every the like I said the length and the velocity of each note, mm-hmm. and it was really yeah. So, um, but I think. Uh, <clears throat> what I learned with that record is that obsessing over music is it's, it's the 
enemy of creativity. Yeah. Um, there's a certain amount of obsession that you have to do when you create, mm -hmm. but at a certain point, it's detrimental to the creative process and to yourself, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned to stop doing that. And with ext or, yeah, extroversion, um, we kind of intentionally went back to a pop format song structure. And I wrote with Lisa mm -hmm. on a lot of that. I wrote with Brian on a lot of that. Um, there was it was more collaboration on that mm -hmm. record, mm -hmm. um, so I think I just was kind of at like a, a, a healthier place, or I was getting there. Um, yeah, and I, I I like that record a lot. Yeah, but I think it's it, a great record, and I think that that was definitely one of your best vocal performances, hands down. I mean, you have you have yeah, incredible range, and it's funny because I'll still put it on. Um, even though, you know, and, and listen to you scream in the background, um, at me for putting it on, but, <laughs> and, you know, at least like, like Lori and I will sit around and we'll listen to it sometimes and we'll be like, man, this voice is really good. Still, I know? need to find and, a copy of that. Thanks. I know. That's crazy. I know. I, I want a I want a hard copy of it. So you'll need to release like, that one. Just if, yeah, it's so, I mean, you know, uh, if, if money were never an object and, right. and listeners were never an object, I would at least put lady killer and extroversion on some sort of physical medium but mm -hmm. uh, i'm not going to put money towards that because sure. i have all the records i need to find yeah oh yeah of um, course yeah i understand that too but you know but it's, that it's, would be awesome yeah I, I would love that yeah um, even if you just had the masters and just like you know dump it out a higher quality and send it to me and then that way i can listen to it i can do better. that i i, I do want to i think that's the only one that i didn't remaster mm -hmm. and um I'll have to find the mix. I think I have the mixes somewhere because I think that act, that record actually could sound really good. It, and it uh, sounded good then. I mean, yeah. I really enjoyed, I loved, I love the programming on it. I love, you know, the compositions and everything like that. And I love, you know, of course my, my guest vocals on your cover of my Sharona were epic. Um, yeah. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> that was honestly that session where we recorded that we, it was, uh, we decided, we did a cover for some eighties compilation. Mm -hmm. We decided to do my Sharona and we did it at 11 in the morning, like on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Yep. You came to help us record. Yep. And we in that got dirt, in our in our dirty ass practice space. Mm -hmm. We drank PBR at like 11 in the morning, got yep. shit faced. Yep. And did it all in like one take. Yep. And it was like the best thing we had recorded in a long time. <laughs> and that was like it was like it, it was it was another moment where I was like, okay. I get like that energy is something that uh, is is worth going after yeah. instead of constantly like overworking something, mm -hmm. working and editing and working and editing, yeah. and never being right. done with it in the end and that right. kind of thing. Yeah, uh, Poop says he loves and misses us both very much. So. Oh, I love that dude. I know, right? I yeah, miss, I miss me some poop. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so the Furnace Street run, I think that kind of like. The, the the moment of uh playing in europe was definitely the the, the kind of like the the um the, the climax moment of definitely that. most definitely yeah, yeah. And it was it was getting a little long in the tooth at that point it was mm -hmm. like it was 10 years on mm -hmm. and um we had uh stopped putting our records out with steadfast and steadfast actually had kind of become less of a thing mm -hmm. um because matt had gotten a lot more busy with Branson right. uh, touring. So, um, so Furnace Street was always looking, we, we worked so hard in that band. Oh yeah. Like three or four nights of practice every week when I wasn't working, I was thinking I was on the laptop trying to book tours, mm -hmm. you know, trying to like trying to find labels to put this stuff out. And I don't know. I, we just, we couldn't find anybody to to put out our records and we just didn't have the money to do it anymore and i right. was honestly just getting so frustrated because i wanted to do it for a living you know right. like right um and uh so then we we ended up talking to this synth pop label in california um and they were going to put extra version out mm -hmm. and we we're so excited mm -hmm. I remember and that. um and then like they sent the contract over and um it didn't feel right uh and I mean, God, at this point, like looking back, I'm like ridiculous, but it just, it, for some reason it, it, it didn't feel right. So I pushed back on something and the guy kind of got an attitude. And then I think at that point, I just got so fucking over it. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, 
I'm done driving myself crazy trying to, you know, do this. It's not bringing me any joy. Right. I, I can barely write music anymore because I'm just constantly obsessing over it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, like, I had, like, kind of decided to, like, stop making music for a while. Right. So we broke Furnace Street up. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a big upheaval in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and Lisa and I kind of kind of went and did our own things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the pinnacle of that right before that happened was right when we went to Europe. Yep. Uh, and um, the three of us went over there and nice. we had gotten invited to, or we, we weren't invited, but well, sort of. But sounds good. Really. We'll go with that. We were invited to play in uh, Belfort, France. Mm -hmm. uh, there was like this music festival for like FIMU, v FIMU mm -hmm. this like musical education. Uh, we weren't even really students. I don't know how we ended up hooking that up, but um, it was great. We were students of music. Exactly. You know? We were students of life. We were students of life. Uh, <laughs> And, and that was great. And so we got to play in front of like the biggest crowds we've ever played. That in was front ridiculous. Of. That yeah, the, it, like the night in the parking lot. People. Yeah. A few thousand people probably. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember. It was dark. It was beautiful. The like after like the first or second song, the, the audience was really into it. Mm -hmm. And um, that that part of France is uh, where the at least according to legend is where the Boos family uh, comes from. Ah, Boos A. Mm hmm. Yeah. So uh, just being there and that was really the only time I've spent in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to go there was really cool. Yeah. Um, and it was just such an amazing experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we came back and all that stuff happened, I just was I was done with it. Yeah. And uh, I think I actually had moved back in with my folks at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just was like, I needed a break. So like I just did a big purge in my life. I got rid of a bunch of shit and I got an apartment and broke up Furnace Street and decided like I'm going to get a second job and I'm just, you know, I'm going to start doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to become a grown up or whatever. I'm going to become a grown up, mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to like pay off my, my credit card debt that I used for the last 10 years to finance this band. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I started really trying to get my life together and then, and then, and then. Uh, my friends in Branson, um, they said that they, my friend Matt called and said that uh, they were working on their new record and um, they wanted to add some electronic stuff in it and wondered if I'd be interested in joining, mm -hmm. helping them write the next record. And uh, I was like, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> so much for not doing music. <laughs> yeah, so much for not doing music anymore. I was like, wait a minute, join a, like a successful band that like, you know, actually goes out and people come to see. And uh, and you don't so have to, you don't have to, you don't have to set it up. It's already done. I, yeah, I don't have to, yeah, I don't have to do all that bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, so that was like 2005. They were back from tour mm -hmm. and they invited me out to go to a practice just to hang out. And when I got there, the bass player was like, oh, yeah, I'm quitting. and I'm moving to like Ann Arbor, I think. And so they were like, well, do you want to join as a bass player? And I said, uh, yeah, OK. And um, so that's how that kind of happened. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've been. Uh, really close friends with those guys forever. Oh yeah. Um, John, John, the bass player actually lived with us. Mm -hmm. Like we're that. hanging out at our house a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the basement concerts and shit like that yes. that we used to do at your place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they, uh, the Branson guys and Matt in particular um, took me sort of under his wing. He was always, he's always been like kind of an older brother to me mm -hmm. and um, his, his success that he had was, he was always willing to share it with me and, uh, so that like he's always been a really like a, a cool like older brother type guy. Oh yeah. Um and um so joining with them and Mike and I have always been close to and the drummer Jared. Mm -hmm. So joining was like, you know, I was just going to be hanging out with my friends. Right. Uh, making music. Mm -hmm. So through that uh I I was in that band for a year um before they broke up. That was a crazy year. It was a yes, it was <laughs> 2006. Yeah, that year yeah. was insane. My first show with them was at South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. We were opening for, I think, um, and you'll know us by the Trail of Dead. Mm -hmm. Finished, then we went on the stage, and then after us was not a surf. And <laughs> this was our first show, <laughs> our first show running electronics, running mm -hmm. backing tracks, and it was all on me. And like, I had 
you know, I ne- I was again in these situations. I'm such a fucking mess. Um, but and we somehow got it to work. And uh, but that yeah, that was it was such an amazing experience. Mm-hmm. I I got to do so much stuff with that band. We um we finally got the electronics working. Um, I think I probably made the drummer deaf because I was always the one that was controlling the, the backing tracks going right. to him like click track. Mm-hmm. And, uh, cause we didn't, I've never trusted the front of house guy to do anything right with electronics. I'm sorry, <laughs> front of house people, <laughs> but you, most of the time you don't know how to mix electronics with, with rock music. Right. You just, they don't. Right. I don't know. I mean, sure. And maybe in this day and age they do back then they sure didn't. So I leave, I leave as much of that work out of their hands. Mm -hmm. So instead, then you can make your drummer fucking deaf. Right. Like you do. I I had that. There was a a boss metronome that had this lady's voice to go one, two, three, four. (laughs) So I would have that in his ear (laughs) counted in before the song would start. Uh huh. And half the time I would look back and he'd be like under the headphones going, one, two, three. <laughs> like half, halfway through the, 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 the shows, he would like rip his headphones off and throw them. <laughs> so I feel like we finally, we finally, um, we finally like uh, perfected that by the time like the band was over. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, yeah, so we toured for about a year. Mm-hmm. Um, halfway through that year, our very good friend passed away. Mm-hmm. Um and so that was fucking insane for yeah. all of us. Yes. Um, and then trying to dig our way out of that. Um, uh, and I was thankful that I was in the band at the time because I was able to like go out and kind of process it out on the road with those guys. Right. Um, and uh, it was, you know, really good experience. Um, I, I feel like uh, joining that band was where I really learned that I am a better oats than a hall. <laughs> um, I am, I, I enjoy it. So I, and I think again, with mastering too, um, mm-hmm. being able to take a project over the finish line and being a part of that is a, it's a really great feeling to, mm-hmm. of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. And I'm just a very impatient person. So I like knowing that like when I'm done, it's done. Right. And yeah. I listen to it, enjoy it. <laughs> um, and so that was really nice, you know, um, I learned how to collaborate with those guys because before I, I did not know how to collaborate. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, we, we were out on the road for six months out of 2006 mm-hmm. uh, and we came home in the, in the winter of that year. Oh, well, we got earlier at the, let me see, at the end of 2005, before we did all the touring, we went to Eudora, Kansas and recorded a record out there. Right. Um, and so I got to learn from, uh, Ed Rose who, um, did like the get up kids and he mm-hmm. did, uh, a bunch of really great, like Midwest emo records. Um, his drum sounds are incredible. His mm-hmm. guitar sounds are amazing. Um, and, uh, he, it, it, whether he wanted to or not sort of became a, a mentor to me. And I learned a lot of things just by watching mm-hmm. and being part of like a process like that, you know, cause I'd never really seen a, a record recorded in a studio with like real preamps and right. somebody knowing what they're doing and shit. I mean, I had, <laughs> but like this, like I was living there for like three weeks, you right. know, that's all we were doing. Um, so that was a super cool experience. Um, but then, you know, we came back and they had been doing it for 10 years. Right. They were kind of in the same place that Furnace Street was. And we kind of went out on that tour with the hopes of, um, getting picked up by a major Mm -hmm. and there were some like we play for uh sony in new york and uh i think the bass amp that i had at the time was really fucked up so i spent like you know 10 minutes on stage trying to get our electronics and the bass to work and i think i'm probably the one that blew that opportunity for the band (laughs) um but you know whatever sorry what's your guys like wasn't the music wasn't like one of the songs on like one of those like teenage dramas on like UPN yeah, or something uh, like that. The, yeah, we had a song in the OC. Yes, that's what it was in the OC. That was an awesome payday. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to pay my rent for a couple months, which was <laughs> um, 
No, that was that was awesome. And mm-hmm. yeah, like I mean, we played, we opened for big bands on that tour. We opened right. for like Paramore mm-hmm. and the Rocket Summer and stuff. So we were playing like theaters. And so it's like you go on stage. The monitoring setup is awesome. Mm-hmm. It's like a professional place, and I love playing in like basements and 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 down and dirty shit too. Sure, but it's also something to like when you're on stage and it sounds good, mm-hmm. and you know that what you're doing is going to sound good to those people. You can kind of at least put that part out. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, so that was a, that was a super cool experience. And but then when I came home, uh, everybody was done and mm-hmm. ready to like do the '30s. You know, grow up buy a house kind of thing mm-hmm. yeah cut your hair look respectable cut, cut it, yeah grow yeah. your mustache grow my mustache yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh jeebus 911 thank you for the follow appreciate it so branson dunn branson dunn Burner street dunn Burner adam street dunn. boost decides to what did I decide to do? Is at this the point? point? Is this a point when you decided to uh, put up the uh, the sign? I think it is. A hang yeah. up my shingle. Hang up your shingle. Get the uh, case yeah. of the shingles. Mm-hmm. It was. It was actually. Yeah, I had met a lot of people on tour, um, and I was kind of starting to do like remixes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought uh, when I came home, I was working at Starbucks when I was out on the road. So when I would come home, I would work at. I would work there, and like so, I had health insurance and shit. Um. And when I came back, yeah, I uh, I was I wasn't sure what uh, what cauliflower audio was going to be, whether it was going to be just like audio services mm-hmm. production. I mean, I, I think anytime you start something like that, you just throw shit at the wall and hope that it sticks and right. whatever happens. Um, but I had been working at um, at A to Z Audio before I, I joined Branson, um, and I'd started doing mastering there. Um, for like cassette and stuff and it was all in the box like waves plugins and stuff um and that was kind of where i got a taste for that mm-hmm. um also in oberlin there's a place called master tech which is a mastering studio out there mm. or acoustic music now mm-hmm. um and uh so i like in between all of that stuff i i had interned with him and i learned what mastering really was mm-hmm. so um that was just something that was interesting. I never liked, I, I tried interning at studios and learning how to record and putting mics on drum kits. And, and I'm, I'm just, I'm a very solitary person. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also just, I don't like the, like I said, I like taking a project over the finish line. Right. I don't like starting a project. Right. It's, it's like, there's too many variables. There's too many possibilities, you know? So with mastering, like when I put a mix up, I hear what I want to do. I hear what the song's missing or what it has too much of or whatever. And I know where I want to take it usually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I was doing remixes. I'd met a lot of people on the road, um, trying my hand at that. Like um, we had a uh, uh, acid used to do these like um, remix contests. Mm-hmm. Um, so we Branson had one of those. So we, we had, we put out like, remix kits and so then i started trying to like you know create my own loops Mm -hmm. and like trying to sell stuff i I was i just i knew i wanted to do something and i didn't know what it was um and i was also mastering um and this was when i was living in in lakewood in this apartment Mm -hmm. and so yeah i decided to call it cauliflower audio and uh it just seemed that the more i worked the more people hired me for mastering Mm -hmm. and i'd already had like 10 years kind of doing like digital you know cleaning up you know very simple but the same basic premise Mm -hmm. um so uh i yeah i worked at starbucks and i got myself a couple credit cards and uh i bought some uh i bought like a dda converter and some nice uh speakers i think they were b and w or not b and w they were dyn audios at the time Mm -hmm. at b and w now um and I just started doing stuff on my laptop. Um, I had, no, I had an iMac at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, it just kind of took off, um, you know, and then, and then I got a call. Uh, oh yeah. So I was working at Starbucks. Um, that's right. I started working in Pennsylvania at that point. Yes. Um, you were working uh, with, um, um, 
what's the name of that company? That was Iron Mountain? Yeah, Iron Mountain, yeah. With yeah, uh, so with um uh Dave Matthews, wasn't it? Yes. Not of the Dave Matthews. No, fan. no, of course not. Now you see we shouldn't have said that. We should have just said Dave Matthews. Yeah, I was working with Dave Matthews yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And th again, that was an amazing <laughs> that was an amazing thing because I got to learn how to uh, use tape machines and mm -hmm. we were we were archiving a lot of um classic records uh so i got to be around like real assets from like old sessions um i got to see like track sheets i got to see like mastering sheets like how you know like how guys really would do the work and so like i really got uh, a good hands-on experience with like how to restore old tapes and that stuff mm -hmm. um so that was another kind of step in the process of, of cauliflower audio learning how to run tape machines um, I was there for a couple hours, a couple years, not hours. <laughs> See, because um, they sent you out to the UK at one point, too, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, I was all over the place. Yeah, I lived they in sent the you all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there for, uh, I think, all in all, like about two months. Mm -hmm. um, that was fucking crazy. Um, it just, you know, just the experiences I had out there is another thing, like another eye-opening step. And kind of all these things, I think, just like in life with most people you just kind of build on experiences and you mm -hmm. take opportunities as, as they come. And, um, you have to be willing to be a little, uh, willing to take some risk, um, to do some crazy things, but, oh, yeah. um, it seemed to work out and, and I was doing that, but, uh, I, yeah, so I was working there, but I was living in Cleveland and trying to drive back and forth and it was like two hours away. So I was trying to find a way to get back to Cleveland mm -hmm. and, uh, um, that was when uh, Clint at Well Made Music had uh, contacted me, um, and he uh, was doing the cutting for Got a Groove, mm -hmm. which is a pressing plant in Cleveland. Um, and he bought, uh, he had two mastering lathes. He just bought a second one, um, and he was getting so busy that he um, needed somebody to run the second lathe when he had overflow work. So at that point, uh, I decided to quit Iron Mountain and I started working over, you know, at his place for like two days a week. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time I was devoting to cauliflower. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year I would buy, like, I bought uh, a compressor first. And every year I would buy just another piece. Um, and I learned how to cut record, how to cut lacquers with Clint. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just another thing of learning how to process audio. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't... Um, so it would sound good coming off of lacquer. Right. Um, I mean, so that's, that was that's, another. That's, that's kind of a trick unto itself. I mean, I'm not sure if a lot of folks understand, know that, you know, mastering for vinyl is a very different process than mastering for digital and everything like that. Yeah. Because, because of the laws digital, of physics. Yeah, exa exactly. With, mm -hmm. yeah, digital is the, it, you're only limited by the, the sample rate and the, mm -hmm. the bit depth. But right. beyond that, you can put pretty much any audio you want on it, whether right. it's into them or not. Um, because uh, vinyl is uh, a completely mechanical and physical, well, and electrical too. Yeah. But you, uh, it, it, there's only so much surface that you space on the record, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so there's only there's only so much of this you can do on a record. Right. If, if the if the cut on it is doing you know all sorts of that, and you know, low frequencies are longer. So there, there is, there's, there's a total, um, there is a physical aspect and a, some of it is looking at metering, looking at, uh, looking under a microscope. Um, and a lot of it is also ear too, right. after doing it for so many you know years and, um, hearing certain instruments or frequencies break up on a, uh, a record. Mm -hmm. You kind of, your ear kind of gets used to hearing things that are be like, oh, that's going to drive something crazy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I learned that over the course of about five or six years. Um, and uh, that was great. Uh, you know, so I, I kind of come up in the digital mastering world, learning how to make shit sound right. And um, a lot of the editing that comes along with mastering, uh, I think that maybe is lost now because when stuff is is uh put up online 
you don't, you know, you can, again, it's like you can put anything you want up online. You right. Can, you, it, it doesn't have to be mastered. It doesn't have to be anything. Right. But if you're making a CD or some sort of physical medium, even with digital, it still has to fall into a certain guideline. So um, a lot of those, um, a lot of that software back then, it was, it was a little more manual and like labor intensive to um, get CDs, you know, authored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um now you can kind of do whatever you want but right. there's still you know all of the uh, in my opinion the best practices for audio uh were perfected in like the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. and that's for digital that's for everything mm -hmm. um because you kind of had a convergence of analog technology reaching its apex right so like there are decades of, of vinyl mastering engineers that have built up to this point. It's like, okay, this is the loudest, best sounding record we can make. Right. And the tape machines have gotten to the point where like, this is the best sounding, you know, you can get rid of the noise. You can get, you know, the transient response and the electronics sound great and everything kind of converged to that point. Mm -hmm. And then uh, digital kind of came along and sort of rewrote everything and, um, and, you know, it took maybe 10 years for people to figure out how to make things ridiculously loud and right. bad. Um, but still, the best practices have not really moved on since then. Mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, I think if you make a record um, with good gain staging, with good mic placement, um, with electronic stuff, you know, if you're running it through nice preamps or, I mean, even shitty stuff. Um, but as long as it, it sounds good and it's adding character mm -hmm. um, and adding harmonic content, um, I kind of f forgot where I was going with this, but uh, <laughs> I think it, it, yeah, I totally lo just lost my <laughs> You were basically just kind of going in the, 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 you know, the, the late, the 80s and 90s, you know, uh, mastering techniques still being viable to even, even recording techniques yeah. i think it's, it's the uh, uh you know um uh so um mike and i uh so uh yeah so anyway golden streets of paradise is the new thing that yes. uh, i'm doing right now mm -hmm. um we kind of skipped over a little bit but um not really like so I, yeah cauliflower audio kind of built up um and I started doing it full time. We moved into a, a dedicated facility in uh, the 78th Street Studios, mm -hmm. which is a really cool art um, space. Uh, and uh, that was where I think that I, I was there for six years up until just about uh, a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, and but that was I feel like I, I truly. Um, I truly became a professional there mm -hmm. and I truly got really good at my craft um, because I was working out of a, of a proper room. Finally, right. I had been, I'd been trying to make spaces work. Um, you hear that? That's my cat screaming. <laughs> um, he misses you. But I, I learned, you know, I had tall enough ceilings in there mm -hmm. and I could honestly hear what was coming out of the speakers. So I, and I worked there for six years. So yeah. I really, learned how to do my job properly yeah it's there. a really good space there definitely um and uh so yeah and then um just about like i said about a month ago or so um you know the future is kind of up in the air i was there for six years like i said mm -hmm. um but just in per my personal life you know you get to a certain point and there's you want to make some changes um and uh so i I was unsure of what was happening at the beginning of the year. And then, you know, obviously COVID happens. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I was uncertain that, as everybody is still uncertain, we don't know what the world is going to look like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and um, having this outside space with my studio and where I, I do, I did love that. I loved that space. Um, but, you know, all of a sudden being told that, uh, everything is being shut down mm -hmm. and I started worrying that I wasn't going to be able to get into my studio. Right. You know, and um, I'm like, this is how I, this is how I make my living. This right. is... So I dragged all of my stuff out of there into my apartment at the time that I was living in. And, uh, 
you don't your your uh, neighbors do not if you have neighbors living above you and below you they do not want to hear you mastering in a living room it turns out <laughs> so yeah funny uh, thing that isn't it <laughs> it is it's a very funny thing you'd think that they would appreciate the art but no yeah it, no you know it's like hey you don't want to hear that same section of 30 seconds for the next two hours yeah why not no. you know some people are so selfish i know totally um so yeah <laughs> so yeah after that i, I was like shit i can't do that mm -hmm. and then it kind of turned out that they weren't going to shut our building down so i moved my studio back um but still just the uncertainty of everything and i'm like i don't know if if this if this business is going to if this is going to be viable mm -hmm. i really need to consider cutting my overhead back and thinking of a different option mm -hmm. um so that's when i started looking to buy a house um, again, and, uh, and we found a really great house, um, and it has everything we need. And so temporarily, um, this is the home of cauliflower audio, um, mm -hmm. in my basement. It's a very large room. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I'll show you here. Let's I'll go for a walk. Tour here. So this is, uh, this is cauliflower audio. I'll turn us around. And um, this is currently my setup. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much looks very similar to what was in the other place. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look nearly as good. Those are ugly pieces of... Those are actually um, bodies that I have uh, stacked in the corner. It's amazing how acoustically deadening corpses can be. It's very, it's very convenient Agreed. considering how many corpses we had to move into this house. I can imagine. I mean, between um, the two of you, you guys must have had at least a couple dozen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We, I mean, we came into it with baggage. Right. Um, so, so yeah, this is cauliflower audio. Uh, lots of wonderful um, equalizers and my compressors and the um, mass select mastering EQ or a uh, mastering uh, console, which mm -hmm is probably my favorite purchase I've ever made in my yes, life. I think it's amazing. And it doesn't even make any sounds. Right. It doesn't even do anything. Um, it removes it, sounds, if anything. Yes. But it made my life um, so much more exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a ton of treatment in here because uh, the ceilings aren't super high in here. Right. Uh, but this is a temporary setup um, because I am currently in the process of designing – uh, with John Brandt, who is a, a, an acoustic designer. Mm -hmm. um, we're building in my garage right now. Um, well, he's working on the, the plans right now. I have to tear all of the drywall out, which I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of get some... Uh, get some daddy issues taken care of. Yeah. Um, but so in the meantime, that this is this is cauliflower audio. This is where I spend my days. This is mm -hmm. where I match your records. And um, can, we get a, a can we get a quick tour of the boards? Is that going to be uh, too difficult to do with the behind other... us? Um, no, the boards as in like what you're what you're working with at in the mastering area. Oh, okay. You've mentioned th that they were things, but <laughs> maybe discussing what those things are. Okay, how's that look? That's not bad. Okay, so this you can at least see the that, that half of the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is uh, my manly uh, massive passive EQ. Oh, oh, hold on, I have a record that's playing in the background. <laughs> It's just spinning in the second center. Okay. Yeah. So this is a manly massive passive um, EQ. Um, very good for broad strokes. Uh, the mid range is fantastic on it. Um, this is my Sontec uh, 250. Mm -hmm. um, it is a. Uh, it's an IC based uh, EQ. Um, and it's very good for cuts. Um, I use it a lot for cuts, but also the top and the bottom for very surgical boosts. It is fantastic. Uh, it is a great EQ and together they kind of cover most of your equalizing, uh, needs. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just a converter, uh, crane song head, pretty, pretty, um, Pretty standard uh, converter. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got my compressors here. Can you move over uh, a little bit more toward the compressors? There we go. Uh, API <laughs> 2500. 
um, very uh, aggressive, cool, bitey sort of uh, compressor. I love it for um, for rhythmic things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love it to uh, give drums a little more punch. Um, it's very flexible, but it, it always has a, this API sort of um, bite to it. Some mm -hmm. people say warmth. I don't. I don't hear that personally. I hear more of a little bit of a bite out of it mm -hmm. that I like. It's very rock and roll. Um, sounds like a distorted guitar, mm -hmm. um, but you know, in the most basic, basic way. Um, this is my Thermionic uh, Phoenix compressor. Mm -hmm. um, it is a tube compressor. It is very good for slow um, compression duties. It's good for softening things. Um, but it does also add uh, harmonic content. Mm -hmm. um, and I also drive it a little bit hard just to kind of get some uh, some juice out of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's good for slow stuff. It's good for kind of controlling um, either harsh top end or if you, your bass is a little bit uh, unruly, you can kind of use the side channels to... Um, sort of control uh it you know like i said in a slow way mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't do fast great but right. I, it's not why i use it mm -hmm. um and then uh like i said my uh mass select uh mastering console which is my most recent purchase i think i purchased it maybe a year or two ago mm -hmm. um and it's really just a router um utility box um it's got great filters on it um it uh I use the filters on it a ton. Mm -hmm. um, it's a router, so I can switch the order of any of this stuff. Nice. Um, I do a lot of work in the mid-side realm, mm -hmm. which uh, your viewers may or may not know. It's like, instead of left and right, it converts the the um, the two channels into a mono uh, channel or mid-channel and a side channel, which is everything that is like... Um, phase incoherent or like left or right pan mm -hmm. so um that actually comes in handy for vinyl mastering on occasion um but it gives me a lot more control of things that i want to do um and it's also a monitor switcher uh and there is cat hair on my stuff it is very it's unusual to have cats uh living in my workspace um but they are very good in assistance well, that's and, the important thing. And they, you know, when when I'm when I've got uh, too much sixty five k, they really let me know. Oh, I bet they do. <laughs> they sing. They, they sing the song of their people at that point. Yeah, yeah. The bugs all come on. They're like, "Oh man, this is a jam." Woo. <laughs> um. So yeah, so that's my thing. And then your monitoring. My, my monitoring are BMW eight hundred fours. Um, they're. Uh, they're older, but you know, I really love the uh, the top end on them, mm -hmm. and I'm so used to these. I've, I think I've had them for about ten years now, and I'm just mm -hmm. I'm so used to them. Um, uh, at some point, I'll probably upgrade. Uh, I think you know, looking down the road after I build the studio, um, you know, big picture things, I'll probably try to upgrade my monitoring mm -hmm. and um, maybe new converters. Uh, so yeah, so that's cauliflower audio behind me. Nice. And, and then, then on the other side, you have some other shit. This is where I, I make music. This is where I work on stuff. Nice. That's Edie. Hi, Edie. Meow. She's very bored. Um, and let's see here. So yeah, I also like to make music, obviously. Um, I love... Andrew knows, uh, Andrew knows this about me. But I have a fascination with old boss drum machines because my first one was a dr550 mm -hmm. um so oh real I quick do have... real quick before you jump in there sam Harmon wants to know if the cat hair adds harmonic content to your mastering um it can mm -hmm. uh but it adds more it's more of a like a woolly low end kind okay. of vibe yeah, okay yeah. It's, okay it, it sticks more to the the kick drums okay very good um, thank you <laughs> uh, yeah. so you'll recognize this Oh yeah, the Jesus. Boss DR220. This yeah. is the E. Um, it has like very uh, Simmons drum sounds in it, which mm -hmm. are my favorite Tom sounds of all time. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I have the DR110, which is analog drum machine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fucking amazing. Um, I added MIDI capability. Oh, you hacker, you. There, there's, there's, there's a MIDI jack in there. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it sounds awesome. The, the kick drum is great. The snare is great. It's got the, the, the clap. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't have the clap. It has that clap sound. It has the clap sound, yeah. Yes. It may have um, the clap. We're not sure. Did you get it tested? May, may it, this is probably really discontinued. No, it's fine. It's good. Um, my w, my trusty W30 that I've had forever. Right. And With your shakers. With slap bass sound. Which there you is, go. Ready for to do the uh, Nine Inch Nails cover? The bass, yeah. <laughs> Also, the only two sounds on there that are worth anything is the slap bass. And there's actually quite a few slap basses on there. Mm -hmm. And then it's got a great string sound. Oh, yeah. Furnace Street yep. all day. Oh, yeah. I remember that sound. Very slow attack. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, love that sound. Uh, let's see. Um, I also, oh, okay. Secret Weapon, um, the Haunted Yamaha Mixer. Oh, which yeah. Which is... Um, it's my first mixer, and you can tell, kind of, let me see. Oh, no, no. Here's, oh yeah, see, this, that sounds this good. This is one of the channels. Oh, yeah. That so, sounds great. So you can, on, you can dry, you can use that to trigger, like, open a gate on, a, on your um, 3630 that you gave me. Yes. Uh, you can use that that sound to open and close gates, and it's very crazy. Oh, nice! Did you ever hack that thing? I did not. Okay, I did not. But I have the instructions to do it. Yes. Somewhere. Um, 80s, 80s going wild here. Woo. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, this is my other favorite thing. Uh, uh, my friend Steve gave me this old Alesis HR sixteen, oh which yeah. I it sat forever by itself, but. Um, I changed the EPROMs. All right, hold on a second. You'll notice it's the Prince sound. Yeah, it totally is. <laughs> um, so, it's, yeah, it's got all the uh, old DMX and um, over, uh, uh, DMX and Lindrum sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, like, you can... I love this drum machine. The sliders, you can play the tempo, so you can kind of make the tempo go a little wonky. Mm -hmm. um, it works great. My only complaint is that uh, I, the um, the samples that the EPROM uses, um, for some reason, when you pitch it down, there's like a there's like a, a click. I don't know if you can hear it, but like Not very well. Uh, zoom Zoom tends to over compress audio, so <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, there's a weird click that happens after the drum sound. So um, lots of de-clicking if I ever use it on a track. <laughs> um, this is uh, Poly 800, which is a great fucking synth. Um, you hacked that thing a little bit, I see. What's that? You hacked that a little bit, I see. There's I some, did. There's some more knobs that don't belong there. Yeah, people think that they're just sitting there. Like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, but I added a, like a filter. This is supposed to be resonance, but um, maybe it's just the sound. Maybe. There we go. There it is. So that's that's a cool option to have. Yeah. I think Furnace Street did a lot with self-oscillating. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. I might be using that later too. <laughs> I know what you're doing. Um, yeah. Haunted mixer. Uh, lots of uh, terrible pedals that are like 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, I have the uh, Volca. The Volca FM. FM, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we've talked about uh, hating FM synth synthesis until recently. Yes. Um, which, hey, I'll admit it. Like, I. I sold out, but um, there is something to be said about like those sounds and um, being able to process things that way because it mm -hmm. is so different. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh, and then and I think that I, those I think that like the the Korg Volca as well as like the the Electron uh, Digitone as well as the model cycles definitely like calmed down FM Insanity a little bit compared to like on a DX7 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Where those it? those high frequency bells and shit. Yeah. Um, and then this is your. Uh, you sold this to me. Oh yeah. I feel like half of my studio is yours. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this. Uh, I um, I don't have my real kit set up down here, um, so I have this, and uh, I have it loaded up with um, Simmons and uh, 909 sounds, I think. Nice. The 909 sounds are the best. Mm-hmm. The kick and snare, you just you can't beat them. No, you can't. They're the best. Yeah. 808 who? I mean... <laughs> 808s are great. 808 but, state, um, but so yeah, so that's uh, that's 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 what this uh, cauliflower audio, and we call this the the pepperoni palace back here. <laughs> why do you call it the pepperoni palace? Why do I call it the pepperoni palace? Why do you call? I, I guess why you call everything anything? I mean, it's you Exa- exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like why I was going to ask about the the uh, audio, you know, cauliflower audio, where that comes from, but oh, um, well, is it from uh, cauliflower ear? Green, uh, you kind of yeah and uh uh shireen my mm-hmm. ex um still a very good friend of mine uh i i can't remember we were we were getting uh late breakfast somewhere in like the middle of the night and i think cauliflower audio just had like a weird ring to it mm-hmm. that um nobody would ever pick mm-hmm. so i never had to worry about somebody like stealing the name or like having like oh well i have to change that now Right. Because somebody else chose a really ridiculous name. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, cauliflower ear and it just, I don't know. Why does anybody pick anything? Yeah. Pepperoni kind of palace. Pepperoni palace. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, <clears throat> you mastered a lot of our stuff. I mean, you actually master pretty much everything that X puts out. Um, which we appreciate folks that don't know X is in fact a record label. It's not my nickname. Please stop calling me that. Um, <laughs> it's my goddamn record label. Buy stuff on it. Every yeah. time you use it as my name, you have to buy one of my albums from now on. That's how this is going to work. Hey, um, man, he doesn't make the rules. It's just the way it is. Exactly. Um, yeah, uh, information Trey says he makes me sound so good. So, Thank you. I you love go. working with you guys. Yeah, it's we, always like, um, you know, I, I don't really have like a genre specific. Um, uh, hold on a second. I have to let my cat out of the room. Okay. <laughs> you Cat's need to get out done. Of here? Look, I'm opening it. Go out. Meow. One of one of several that live here. How many me. cats do you have? I have three. Okay. You said you, I, you sounded like you sound at first. It sounded like I have. I have three now, but that might change. Well, there will be more moving in. Okay. Um, there will be five at one point. Oh my lord! Um, I know it's. I, I never wanted to have three cats. I never wanted to have two. Well, I wanted two cats. Okay. And then cats are such that um, they give you that um, toxoplasmosis where yes. they make you want more, more of cats. them. Yeah. And I definitely have. That. And you started snorting the the the, the toxopox stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah we as, do lots of that every night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you want more cats the next day. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's it's a it's a really sad cycle that you, people get into. It is fucking cat people, man. I don't understand them. So anyway, so you don't have a specific genre that you work in. No, but um, you know, I come from electronic music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I come from drum machines and all of that stuff. And so when I work with you guys, it's always fun. Um, it's it's such a different thing, you know. Uh, working on like an, uh, a record with microphones mm-hmm. versus records with electronic stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just like, a, it's a different approach. Um, but there's nothing like getting something that has like a really good groove or like a really heavy kick drum mm-hmm. and then just finding the sweet spot on a compressor um, to make it really kind of move mm-hmm. and kind of bring that groove in. Um that's super fun, yeah. you know, finding the kick drum in the mix and like, you know, and then doing stuff to accentuate it. So mm-hmm. like there's the 
the, the compressors in a cool way. Um, so that's why I always like working with you guys because it's, I, I wouldn't say I don't work on electronic music often, but it's not what I work on most. Sure. Sure. I mean, it's kind of a, I mean, especially in, if you're looking regionally, it's such a small right. little thing that, I mean, for yes. the most part, you're dealing more with guitar based bands and stuff like that or. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. And I think that one of the things that we like about working with you is that you kind of become like a part of the whole team thing in a way, you know, and that you'll come back to us and make, suggestions and stuff because i mean i'm a fucking hack when it comes to all this stuff and you know having you come back and saying hey you know did you think of you know, I'm, I'm hearing this is that intentional or you know i'm hearing something that that you know we might want to bring this down or you know change this around a little bit or something like that do you want to work on that before i you know, before i dive in um right. you know that kind of thing and i think that that's helpful is like crazy because you know having having a mastering engineer First of all, having a mastering engineer around, period, I think is very good. I tend to get married to my mixes and my music, and I don't want to, I don't want to be the final ears that hear the product, mm -hmm. you know, and I want somebody else to go through it and, you know, fix what, or tell me what to fix, or, you know, go through and, and, and put that final polish on, which is great and having that relationship with you is fantastic because hey you'll come back and be honest with me and say like dude that sounds like fucking like you, you mix that in the fucking bathroom um <laughs> dude you I need, mean, you need yeah, new fucking speakers you know that kind yeah, of thing <laughs> I, I, yeah it's it's definitely um it, it the the monitoring environment mm -hmm. um i you know i think like becoming good at anything like an engineer or a musician or anything like that you read these things that you think you understand, right? Like, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. But then like, until you start doing it, you finally understand it. Like having a second ear on your work. I, if anything, during the furnace street period, I wish that I was more open to collaboration and mm -hmm. hearing criticism. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of artists, and I was certainly guilty of this, of this, um, you know, when you're an artist, uh, you, you, you tend to be sensitive. Um, and when you're a young artist, you have the potential to like take things personally mm -hmm. and you hear a critique of your art as an attack on you. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it, it, it makes like, it's like, you kind of have to get over that aspect before you can really, you know, collaborate. And some people are, are really good at it. I was not, I mm -hmm. had a hard time with it. Um, but I finally, I finally, well, it's a process, Yeah. But, um, but having somebody that you trust that is listening to it and it, there's no, you know, I think I've been doing this long enough to where there's very little of my ego in my mastering work. Mm -hmm. There is always because I'm a Scorpio and also I'm just, you know, that's the way things go. Sure. But I try to take myself out of it mm -hmm. and I'm not, I don't really listen um, for the art when I'm mastering. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know, whether the music I appreciate it or not, is somewhat irrelevant because right. I'm not listening for that at all. When mm -hmm. I put something on, I'm listening purely from like a, I don't know, I see like a, a not colors, but like I, I hear where there are things in the frequency spectrum that I want to do something with. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, and I guess in a way when you clear those things out, it helps the emotional content come through mm -hmm. or maybe, or, if you emphasize certain things, it can help it come through. Sure. Um, but I, I'm purely coming from a, I don't want to say purely, but mostly coming from a technical aspect. Mm -hmm. And I hope that like when I do come, go back to clients like you um, and I say, Hey, can you, you know, look at this? Um, it's never coming from a place where I'm trying to exert what I think, because at the end right. of the day, it's my project. Right. I, I don't, I'm merely listening to it and thinking, okay, this is where I think they want it to go. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. this is maybe what they were hearing in their listening environment, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sound like that here. So let me see what I can do to get it to sound like what I think it's supposed to sound like in their head and mm -hmm. in their room. Right. So, um, I mean, I have techniques that I do with most records. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and then, you know, and I'm always learning new stuff. Um, but um, yeah, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. That's okay. Hi, kitty. There's this is another one. This is Oscar or Oliver. You can call him 
whichever you'd like. Hi, Oscar. Oscar. Um, but yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm never trying to hurt people's feelings mm -hmm. or I, I, there was that meme recently that I thought was pretty funny with Dr. Phil, where it was like, you're ugly, you're stupid. I'm going to kill you. Give me $200. <laughs> people are saying that's what mastering guys do, <laughs> <laughs> which I mean, I get it, but I, I, it's never coming from a place where I'm trying to, I, I understand what it's like to be a musician mm -hmm. and, and, and to be at a place where you're like, you've listened to as much as you can. You're obviously in the weeds mm -hmm. and you're hearing, you're listening for things that, that are important to you, mm -hmm. but maybe not may, might be the important to the end listener. Right. So like you're obsessing over this. And this is even me talking about a project I re mixed recently. I'm worried about like, Hmm. Should the, the, the delay on the vocal have a, like a couple more DB brightness to it mm -hmm. um, where nobody ever fucking cares about yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. like nobody that's listening to it going to be like, man, that song would have been great, but they really brightened up that delay a little. Bit. Yeah. Well, if, if only those hi hats were a little bit more, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Kind of I think care. Ken Marshall said that. In one of yeah. His that's, yeah exactly. that's where I was kind of going about with that. the hi hat. Yeah. Which he's fucking fantastic too. Yeah, if uh, people do not follow Ken Highwatt Marshall on YouTube, uh, he's a guy who's engineered like Skinny Puppy and Frontline Assembly and a bunch of like those industrial bands and worked with a bunch of yeah. artists. And he has this YouTube channel, which you know I just listed off a whole bunch of like really like angsty, angry bands. But this dude is quite possibly the happiest engineer I've ever like seen ever. He's so excited to tell you everything about what's going on. Even he, he, is. he can't point to things without his pinky sticking out, but you know. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I, yeah. I love he, watching his, him. His attitude is so fantastic. That's, mm -hmm. it's something that like I, he, because he's so supportive and um, I think I still work on this now. Like, it, and I think it is, I don't know if it's a Cleveland thing or what, but like, there is this like guarded, slightly threatened thing that a lot of Cleveland musicians have. Yeah. And I'm not pointing my finger because I, I have struggled with it in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and like somebody like Ken or people that are really confident in what they do or they just have been doing it for so long. Um, they're so positive and yeah. giving and they just want to share what they've learned. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's super awesome because that's that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It's like learning how to um how to collaborate with people and learning how to take advice without without it like totally giving you like a mental health day right you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. um and uh so like people like him are just fantastic when they're just super open and giving and i've had a lot of people in my life like that mm -hmm. um, and uh so hopefully as i get older and i kind of know what i'm doing more i can share that with people right. because i think part of the reason is cleveland doesn't have a there's not a huge like infrastructure of like great producers right. and like and i'm not saying like and great studios and i'm not saying there aren't great studios here but it's like there isn't a an infrastructure of and i this is no secret people have been trying to fix this for a long time oh yeah but like, you know, so good songwriters and producers and people that can just like share information with you and mm -hmm. make your art better. Right. It's not like they're trying to put their stamp on you. You're just making your art better because art doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't come from nowhere. Right. Exactly. Uh, um, so I really appreciate that stuff. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so working with you and like, you know, say if, if I listen to something and there's a there's um. Yeah, this sorry, this cat's insane. Um, <laughs> uh, um, wanting to just help people get their their project over the over the um, the the finish line, I mm -hmm. guess. And um, yeah, that's yeah. I really appreciate people that. And I when I get a mix, I I don't often send things back to people. Mm -hmm. um, I only try to do it if there's something that is that I think was either a mistake in the mm -hmm. export or their their monitoring environment was such that they didn't hear this this issue mm -hmm. um or if it's just uh limited and slammed beyond belief and there's nothing i can do to it but just make it louder yeah uh, here's our brick wall you know 
that happens a lot. And I used to send things back a lot more now. Um, but I did learn that like, there is something to be said about, and I'm not going to say this is, I, I, I advise this, but there's something to be said about people putting somewhat of a limiter on their, their final output, because it, I mean, you know, the dirty secret is the more limiting you stack on top of each other, it does get louder. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's just the nature of it. You're removing transients. Right. So if somebody's removed like six dB of the transients already before mm -hmm. it even comes to me, then I can make it a lot louder. But so, you know, if that's the end goal, fucking like, you know, crank up the one to three K and slam it through a limiter and you're, you'll have a loud record. Right. Um, but if you want a good sounding record, don't do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that that's, I mean, that's kind of a big thing is, I know that, you know, the, the loudness war is, I don't know how still critical that is as it used to be, the so-called yeah. loudness war is when people were trying to make the loudest music or albums, you know, through mastering and stuff like that, and in the same token, you know, just killed any kind of dynamic range that you have so that everything is, you know, right there right. and tires yeah. your ears out after listening to it for the first 35 seconds. Yeah. Um, I mean, is that still a thing? Um, yes, very much. Okay. Um, because there's, a, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. Um, again, like we, we just kind of touched on this where like you read something and it's like, oh, well, that's clearly how it is. And that's what, that's what every engineer in the world has ever said. So that's what I'm going to do. Like right. never, never clip your output. Mm -hmm. If you clip the output, you're a fucking hack and you should, you know, hang up your engineer. Um, now I don't clip the output to get level but i know a lot of engineers do and there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with it it's just right. you have to know what you're doing mm -hmm. um but that's kind of one of those things where like uh experience is is the the most important thing right. and uh, our ears over the past like 15 years have gotten accustomed to loud mastering mm -hmm. um and now we're when you hear a record that isn't mastered in this modern way it, it is it's a little it's a little unsettling and unusual and you might think it's amateur sounding, mm -hmm. but then if you give it a listen for like, you know, you, once you get into that space, then it doesn't matter where the volume, what the volume knob is. Right. It's just like, you have to, you have to get over that aspect of, um, but then again, like, like there's certain genres of music that they're supposed to be loud. Right. And I can get a record sounding really loud without it sounding like shit. Mm -hmm. Um, but, is it it's probably not going to be the loudest record record out there because right. those that when they when it's the loudest record it does not sound great um it might sound loud and it might be aggressive and it you know but like this is something that i think people have have uh, gotten away from like since you know uh flood i think and all the mm -hmm. and, and even back to steely dan when they started like um triggering drums um with samples um this is something that i i uh working on the new golden streets record we discovered um that um you know it's it's so common now you go into a studio well that's not common anymore but it yeah. used to be <laughs> if, if, if you were if you were recording a drum kit you know you um you set your mics up, you get your whole, your drum kit set up and there's already probably EQing and filtering and compression going on mm -hmm. there. You record it, it goes in and then it's very normal to quantize your performances now, you know, so you split up the track and you, it goes, falls on, you know, even if you're doing it like 15%, you mm -hmm. know, it's still fixing it. And then while well, that, not every snare drum hit is exactly the same. So I better right. put a trigger under it like a sample mm -hmm. that's exactly the same. And that sample has been filtered and EQ'd and compressed. And then, you know, it's like, well, that drum actually sounds better than the recorded ones. So we'll, we'll tuck the recorded ones down. Yep. And then that, that track probably gets compressed. And then all those drums go into a bus compressor. Mm -hmm. And then there's a compressor on the output bus over the whole mix that he EQ'd. And that's even before it comes to the mastering guy. Right. He's probably going to put another set of filters and two more compressors on it. So it's like you see how everything gets loud. Right. And how everything gets like sounding how modern things sound. Right. Um, 
but people don't realize what what like normal kick drums sound like and mm-hmm. like put on an old police record mm-hmm. and this is this it's kind of it was a little bit of my like uh inspiration for some of the mixing on this this new record um his drums are so fucking loud on that on the like the like Zenyatta Mandata record. Mm-hmm. It's snare, it's like uh, it, like if you turn it up, it'll like make you squint your eyes, you know. And uh, but you can't do that with a loud mastered record right. because you you're you're you limit a record, mm-hmm. and the snare and the kick is always the first thing to go. Right. Um, depending on how it's EQ'd mm-hmm. or how it's recorded, so then your snare is just coming into the mix. And I'm not saying that's bad, but what I'm saying is that, like, the most emotional records, you know, are the ones where it actually, you can hear the nuances of the, of the player. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, it's so unusual how, like, modern recordings are just, they're, they're, and I'm not, look, I, I do this. I'm not saying that, like, I don't edit drums and I don't make shit sound good because of course I want to sound good. Right. But like, um, good is is uh, obviously uh, very um, very uh, shapeless, you know, in terms of what people think is good. Mm-hmm. But you know, try not to um, try not to um, high pass everything. Uh, that that you know, don't high pass every track in your mix. Yeah. Like that's that is an easy way to get everything clean and to have its own place. But think about it before you record it. Like, think about what you're going to record and try to get, you know, if you record your drums first, Mm -hmm. get them sounding good, make them, you know, get the, you know, the the groove and the transients fitting where you want to. Don't filter the shit out of it. And then add your elements on top of it and make those elements, like, spectrally shaped in a way that it sounds good. Right. Right. So you're you're not necessarily um, starting with a mix, but try to you know move your mics around or um, run your 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 electronics through some preamps or, or things that are like uh, are going to add some sort of color and harmonic content. I say harmonic content a lot, uh, but it, but it does it like it gives it it gives it a space that it'll fit in the mix. Mm-hmm. And if you start with elements that are all recorded properly Mm -hmm. um don't try to fucking get rid of the hum like in post the more you fix things on the way going in and get a good performance too like don't try to like i mean and that's like the antithesis of what a lot of people do now but i think i think something that i've learned recently is less is more and you you know if you can make a record thinking about okay i have a console i have a couple of compressors i have a couple of eqs um and i have a cat um <laughs> i love how comfortable he's made um <laughs> and try to make your record with 24 tracks or less 23 mm-hmm. really because your 24th track is your simpty track right Know, that you sync to your everything but um <laughs> man you should be able to fucking make a great sounding record with 23 tracks um it's the more things you stack on top of each other the more things start like you know phasing out of right. each other and uh just try to get good source material mm-hmm. and good performances mm-hmm. and oh, here's another one <laughs> um yeah, uh, that's 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 what I've learned recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, less is more. Yeah. Try to get good recordings, good performances. Um, it, but at the same time, don't fucking obsess over things. Don't stress out. Yeah. Um, re- creating is not supposed to be. If you're being miserable from creating, it should be from the the subject matter. It yes. Should not be. It should not be from, the process. No, not at all. It should be fun. Mm-hmm. Creating should be free. Um, and uh, whatever you can do to get to that point in your personal life, because uh, all that shit goes hand in hand. Sure. You know, if you're a mess upstairs, um, then you're going to be a mess with whatever you do. So, right. like, you know, um, try to try try to um, you know 
look at creating I mean, you shouldn't even be thinking when you're creating it should just be you know I, I can't tell you how to quiet your mind down but right if you can then just create and mm -hmm. stop obsessing over how long that hi-hat is right <laughs> or yeah anything don't yeah. don't think that you have to have 68 tracks of stuff you know i think the plasma blackout the plasma blackout album i think the most had like probably nine see <laughs> you know and just like all right and most of yeah. the missile command song tracks were like nine ten tracks yeah. you know yeah. you're just like you know we can do this really you know why bother you're just filling shit up after a while and it's just getting everybody yeah. confused everything should have a space it mm -hmm. should you know, everything should be intentional and mm -hmm. uh and fun and fun yeah. yeah absolutely why like look at all this shit that's surrounding you mm -hmm. like it looks fun as hell if you're if you're bummed out when you're surrounded by all that stuff, then you're doing it wrong. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's just it. This is the, the little playroom, you know. I just come yeah, down here exactly. and get to have fun with stuff, and exactly that's the whole thing. And that will come across, you yeah. know. If you're if you're having that was like the the my Sharona thing. Mm -hmm. We had a blast doing that, mm -hmm. and it comes across. You can hear when somebody's not having fun when they're recording. Yes. Yes. Um, Moonhouse asks a couple questions here on the chat. He was asking uh, if you if you master differently for streaming, uh, for streaming services as opposed to like physical stuff. No. Okay. <laughs> that's <another laughs> no. One. Fuck you. <laughs> that's um. That's an. That is a. I mean, yes and no. Okay. Um. There's a lot of information out there, and with with the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. Um, people trying to end the loudness war by um, because most of the streaming services do have some sort of volume normalization. Correct. They have different targets, mm -hmm. so they'll it'll analyze your track, and then depending on the averages of that track, it'll place it where it thinks is the correct loudness. Whereas this track would also have the same correct loudness. Right. So in theory, you should be able to mix at lower levels. Mm -hmm. And things should kind of fall in together. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great idea, but it, it's it's never going to be implemented properly because um, it's every song is completely different. Right. Every the, the spectral shape of it is different, and those things those things are weighted to different frequencies. Mm -hmm. And if you have like a ten minute song with one super loud fucking part. And then everything else is super quiet. The average of that is going to make it do something totally different. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, what a lot of mastering guys do, um, and you can, you know, if you don't believe me, buy going onto uh, like iTunes or listen to the outputs and look at them, and they're squashed. Yeah, they're they're still squashed. I don't. Um, I don't go for the loudest thing that I can when I'm mastering. Mm -hmm. I, I go for something that sounds good. It sounds modern. People aren't going to send it back and say, make it louder. But I do not destroy someone's mix mm -hmm. unless they ask me to. And, okay. and, he, and then I'm like, you sure you want to do that? Yeah. Um, but long story short, um, I don't do that. I keep things at the same relative level, knowing that if it sounds good where I put it, when it's lowered the four, six, seven dB to stream on Spotify or, mm -hmm. or iTunes or whatever, it's going to sound right. Mm -hmm. um, that's just that's just the nature of, of the, the the beast. A mm -hmm. lot of people will ask me. That's been a, a, a question I've gotten a lot more um, because there are people that are trying to fix the loudness scores by saying, put your stuff out at like minus fourteen or whatever, and like it doesn't matter. But a lot of those mixes, they don't sound right at, yeah. the, at a lower level. No. Like, you know, common sense would say, okay, well, I've got this limiter, like pumping this mix out like 8 dB. Okay, so if I take that limiter off, it should sound way better. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. It, or maybe it doesn't because it's it's part of the mix now. You right. mixed it to the, that limiter. You got used to that limiter. Yep. You know, you got used to the way it was treating the snare drums. So now if you take that off, the mix falls apart and mm -hmm. it doesn't might not sound better. So um, I think, you know, with the loudness stuff again, like I'm about to put out a record of music that uh, Mike and I have made. And we're in the final stages where I'm like, 
okay, what do I want to do with the level? But we mix it in such a way that, you know, it, we push it to a certain point, And if you go any further to it, it just starts, it starts taking away what I love about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you have to, you know, get comfortable with like, okay, well this, this record's probably going to be about four DB quieter than pop music that's out right now. Right. But if you get, if, if it's, it's your intention and you feel good about that intention, then fuck it and, and put the record out because, you know, people, if people are judging music based on how loud it is, they probably don't really love music. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, uh, so, you know, okay. So the record comes on and it's not as loud as the one that was just before you turn it up and now it sounds like it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, after 30 seconds, you're not even thinking about the song before it. Yeah. So I'm not saying that loud records aren't aren't appropriate they, they are for certain genres and like i said if you take the limiter off and the mix falls apart then that's the way we make music now mm -hmm. um but you know uh if you do come out with a record that's quieter and you are shooting for dynamics feel good about it because mm -hmm. um you know it's that is kind of a punk rock thing to do in this day and age yeah you know? oh yeah absolutely yeah. yeah i love messing with the dynamics and stuff and that's why mm -hmm. Again, it was like, dude, don't, don't make it loud. Just yeah. Let things work. Um, yeah. Um, Poop asks, advice needed from you both. What would you recommend for getting the mojo going after a long time of not writing? Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they help me, so... Uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah, drugs, drugs, <laughs> and um, um, I don't know. I think I think with age, like you, uh, Poop is 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 such an incredible musician. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been super impressed with with uh, his programming skills and his sensibilities. Mm -hmm. um, the cinema was I, amazing stuff. Yeah, uh, like his his ambient uh, mm -hmm. his ambient work is is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always liked his sensibilities. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just uh, just do it for fun and um, make a record that uh, Andrew and I want to listen to. Yeah, that's what you need to do. Simple. That's how you start. Yeah, make it make an album that, that Adam and I want to listen to. Have fun with it. Really, that's I think right. that that's the thing is, is that if, you, if it's not fun, then don't do it, especially with music anymore. I, to me, totally. that's very much because, you know, after a while, for a while, it was not fun for me to do it. And so I stopped. Yeah. Um, and to the point where I almost sold everything and decided that I was just going to have a big empty basement instead that I could like cry in or something. Um, but crying. yeah, crying is another way you can do it. But uh, <laughs> another tip, don't, crying. Don't, you ha if you're, if you're doing, if you're crying and you're feeling good, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, make it fun. I mean, you know, there, there are certain things that I started doing um, that really helped for my creativity, you know, and it's, it sounds, it sounds antithetical, but I was doing stuff like I would, you know, write a piece of music and then not save it. You know, literally just like I'd sit down with a piece of gear and like, oh, this sounds really, really cool. I really like what I'm doing. And then just shut it yeah. off and delete it. Just an exercise. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's like the, the spooky action thing. That's basically what we were doing. And we didn't save anything. We just recorded it and we couldn't yeah. go back and redo it. And it was like, that's now, it. Did you, did you guys, you guys started with like, um, like uh like a kind of like a folder of ideas and then you kind of would jump off from there or shit literally just born on the spot my my octatrack sampler literally has one folder on it and it has all the samples that i own in it and that's how we yeah. started it so oh, it's literally shit. just kind of like yeah. like i'm in there i'm i'm in the middle of the show trying to find something and hoping to god it works with the next thing you yeah. know it was it, it, it's uh someone said it, that our concerts were kind of like watching two guys trying to disarm a nuclear bomb for a half an hour <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that because we were kind of panicking the entire time. Yeah, I mean that's that's the energy. Though. Yeah, I've never I've never done I've never done a um an improvised live show. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would be comfortable doing it. It's like, it, I, yeah, and like I said, that's it's kind of like it's weird because it's kind of a scene, right? Right. Anymore, because like I said, like with like especially on Twitch and stuff like that, that's a big thing. Is there's a whole bunch of us that do this live improv. You know, I'm just looking at the people who are on the chat right now and like Moon House does this kind of stuff and, you know, myself and uh, um, Information Tray is getting into that kind of stuff as well. Act Detect is really good at that. You know, there's, there's this whole little goofy scene of us um, that go and we do these things and it's a lot of fun. 
Um, and the thing is, and the nice thing is, is that for the most part, we're basically just doing it for other people that are doing this stuff anyway. So right. it's a it's it's a very forgiving environment, unlike yeah. going out and playing shows and stuff like that, where if you fuck up, no one's going to sit there and be like, you're an asshole or anything like that. So. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's it's like a it's a it's like a, a club. And yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah, something it's... that yeah, sharing like uh, energy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's I, and that's... I have to come in and we we haven't done nearly enough together musically. No, we really haven't. I think the only th I mean, we. You you helped me doing live sound stuff with Missile Command, yes. Which that was fun. That was before that was before wireless mixing was a thing. Yes. Now that it yeah, is, a, that, and so we would bullshit it. That was a lot of. <laughs> Adam. Yeah, that was that was some cutting edge shit that we were doing. <laughs> yeah. Remote remote desktop fuck. into my laptop and mix this shit live. with a with a mouse with a mouse. <laughs> what the fuck. <laughs> I'm trying like, to get it to work oh otherwise. Shit. I'm on the main vocal track. I hope I don't fucking double click and set it back to zero and <laughs> blow everybody's ears out. No stress, Adam. <laughs> no. But those were fun. That, yeah. And that was, yeah, that was some that was some like inventor shit. Yeah, I remember because I remember we got, I got main stage when it came out. Mm -hmm. And then I had a show the next week. I'm like, we're gonna use main stage. I don't know how this yeah. works. I got a week to figure it out. Fuck. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we got it working. It was all yeah. good. It only crashed. Yeah. Anyways. But it I mean, did. It yeah. always worked well. Yeah. It was fun. But I think, um, yeah, so we did that. And then we, um, we, I mean, we were in Film and 38 together for a while, too, when we were the Industrial yes. Boy Band. Um, that was super fun. Oh, yeah. That was a lot of drinking. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, that was super fun, man. I loved playing with you guys. Mm -hmm. Um. I still love playing with Rob. I oh yeah, the, I have a vi there's a very um, I have a very soft spot in my heart for like just really good like aggressive EBM, mm -hmm. and uh, he does it so well. Yeah, like he Rob is always like the first time I heard I, I can't remember was he in Parancuva? Yeah, he was in Parancuva. That was a, I um, that was and I remember job. hearing him and I was just like, man, this guy like he he's got something mm -hmm. and like. I love every record he puts out mm -hmm. um, and it was super fun to play in that band with you. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was a blast. Yeah. That was, it was at my skinniest because it was like a fucking like aerobic workout every band practice. Yeah. Was. I was, I was quite skinny back then too. Yeah. Uh, so. Information trace as am I the only industrial musician in Cleveland who wasn't in filament? Correct. You are the only one. Yeah. No, I think, I think TechSpeak wasn't in it either. <laughs> he probably did remixes. Though. Yeah, probably. I think he did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he was there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's all over everything. Uh, yeah. Poop says, thank you. I guess I just need to sit down and not push it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, you know, make it fun. Make it enjoyable, yeah. you know. Or it's... collaborate. Like, yeah. um, do it. Like, have somebody send you an idea or start an idea and send it to somebody. Mm -hmm. like, collaboration is, is – um, there's, you know, and especially doing it with somebody that you really trust mm -hmm. and you really like, mm -hmm. because they're, you know, if you guys are going in the same direction, it's going to be awesome. And the pressure is off. So collaboration is yeah. actually way underrated. Oh, yeah. And collaborating right now in this day and age with like, you know, the social distancing and COVID is completely possible. I mean, there's plenty of tools out there, you know, I tell Google Drive in a dream, you know, um, yeah. that's how... That's how Justin and I were collaborating earlier this year on a track. And that's how um, myself and Justin Information Tray are going to be working on a soundtrack to Metropolis. And so we're going to be doing that all. Remotely. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So we're doing that. We're going to literally be just shooting ideas back and forth that way and collaborating. So there's ways to do it. It's a lot of it is just, you know, and like you said, it's just like, you know, getting the, getting your team together, of people that you that you like and that you trust mm -hmm. and everything like that and working with those yeah. folks. Yeah. And it's definitely a big thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if if uh, yeah, if you're if you're freaking out about starting a project, you know, because it is daunting, mm -hmm. and that's I I don't like starting music anymore unless I know that somebody like I'm handing it off to somebody mm -hmm. um, in some shape or form. Like with Golden Streets, um, I'll start songs and then Mike will finish them, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Um, so yeah, if 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 uh, Matt is uh, kind of a little anxious about starting starting with somebody else or knowing that it's going in somebody else's hands, like can really get it. The 
because then you have two people excited about it. Yeah, exactly. And that's way more fun than mm-hmm. like being the only one. Right. Than sitting in your basement going, this is awesome. And then like, yeah, you, 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 you in the basement are excited. And the cat's like, uh, yeah. that's a dagger. Right. I'm going to take a nap on your keyboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we've been talking for over two hours now. Well, so thank you. I think we should be, go ahead and call it. Thank you again, Adam, for coming on. Um, Absolutely. Adam Boos, caulifloweraudio.com. Uh, his link has been popping up in the Discord or in the chat room. Uh, if you do like what we've been doing here um, or any of this crazy shit that I've been doing, check out the music on xstudios.net. Uh, it has myself an information tray and um, Justin, also uh, known as, uh, wow, I totally sorry. Thank you. You know me better than that. Uh, Subsoma's on there, Missile Command, Incrementum, a bunch of crazy shit, uh, Spooky Action at a Distance, all that kind of thing. Um, next week, like I said, is Synth Weekend from the Golden Shrimp Guild, your buddies in synthesis love. Uh, we'll be doing, I think, I think we're starting Friday at 5 p.m. and we're going until Sunday at 4 a.m., I think. Oh, wow. Of nonstop streams of electronic improvisational insanity uh we do this every month i'll be on from 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern time we have folks from all around the world uh act detect who's on the chat line is if you get to see his sets his stuff is absolutely fucking phenomenal um moon house i believe is also doing a set and he is also absolutely fucking phenomenal everybody who's in the shrimp guild does such incredible work and everything like that so and no. <laughs> cat no. sorry <laughs> Right. And if people want to, if people, you know, folks join up onto the shrimp guild, you can see it up in the chat line, uh, join the, join the server. You want to start working on music you want to start working on streams and stuff like that. Hop in there and start doing it. There's a lot of folks that give you that are, that are incredible for giving inspiration, giving you ideas, telling you how to get things done. I'm surprised we have not seen the cat's butthole yet. Um, <laughs> Moonhouse says turn into a cow here, and that's a, a turn almost turned into a Cheerio party. Um, <laughs> so we got that going on. Um, I think I think we're starting up with the Tuesday afternoon music gear tech show. Myself and Rodney Orpheus. Um, I think that's coming back on, but who knows? Um, and then we are on hiatus with Gear Splaining, which is the Wednesday night music tech gear show until the fall. But I think Rodney's almost done recording the new Cassandra Complex album, so which means he'll have some time to hang out and we'll talk about gear and I can give him shit for whatever I feel like giving him shit about. So anyway, Adam, again, thank you so much for coming on. Andrew, it was a pleasure. Everybody out in the chat, thanks again for watching. This will be up on YouTube and you can go back and rewatch it if you want to or tell your friends and you can use it for your spank bank material. So I'm gonna. Uh, me too. I can't wait to masturbate to us. I have. Never mind. <laughs> I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Call me. Wait, what? All right, y'all. Thanks a lot. Take care. See ya.